pleasure to introduce these two competitors today. Coming from Norway, playing his Lugia Archeops deck, Tord Reklev! And also coming from Italy, also playing the Lugia Archeops deck, Lucas Calza! These two players have competed hard all weekend long, but it comes down to one final match. Players, take your seats and best of luck. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Chip. We're so excited to see both of these players get the action underway here as we will be crowning the Latin America International Champion once we see who wins this best of three. Very excited to see this match. The best Lugia players over the whole weekend. It's really going to be a sight to see. And for everyone who's preparing for their next tournaments, you'll surely be facing off a lot of Lugia mirrors or at the very least, a lot of Lugia decks. So watching this is going to be very important if you want to learn how to navigate that matchup. Yep, a lot of players that weren't able to make it to this event or at least uh, weren't able to make it to Championship Sunday now are looking on, thinking about their local events, perhaps traveling to the Toronto Regionals that will be coming up shortly. And you have to think that uh, there's going to be a lot of Lugia Archeos uh, in the near future. So I wonder how this will affect the metagame in Toronto, though. Do you see this and think Lugia is unbeatable, I need to join them and try my luck? at winning that coin flip to get the advantage, or will players really go even more out of their way to hard counter this deck? Yeah, can I can I make my, my Vika Vault deck work and uh, maybe shut down everything before it gets going? And we'll, we'll have to see what these players end up finding, but this is, uh, maybe you do just test your luck as the, uh, the very consistent Lugia Argyops player against some of the other greats in the field. We've seen some pretty incredible records in the mirror matches from uh, the likes of uh, Tord and John Ng and Natalie Miller, many other players that were able to grace us with their presence on the, the main stage. So excited to see how that uh, ends up in the future. Now on screen, we did have both players' accomplishments. We did see those big icy wins for Tord, those really fantastic results for Lucas, but this is definitely the biggest match in his Pokemon career. Yep, we have two incredible players lined up here. Toward, of course, the accomplishments speak for themselves. A three-time Latin or a three-time international champion and trying to accomplish uh, the unthinkable here with the fourth win. And Lucas Calza would love to add this to his list of accomplishments. Such an incredible player in the recent history of the game with so many accolades and now an opportunity of a lifetime. I really love how. Uh, Lucas chose Luminion as one of the vital Pokemon in his deck list as he is playing two copies of that card in his deck. We've been praising Luminion all weekend. Lucas recognizes how good that card is and he is, I believe, the first player we've seen that's playing two copies of that card. And I have to wonder, are we eventually going to see a player playing four copies of Luminion V just as we saw four copies of Tapu Lele GX at one point? Yeah, I believe we did see Stefan earlier playing the, the double copy of uh, Luminion, but it just speaks to how incredible that card is. It, it handles these one price Pokemon in the matchup so well. You're able to knock out that amazing rare Evitol or the Radiant Charizard, and you can just keep those energies preserved. Put a V Pokemon back into your deck and leave an Archeops or an Oranguru in the active spot and feel pretty comfortable. Yeah, and there's a few other differences in both players' deck list. We are going to see their prizes right here, those who have to see if there's anything too impactful. First, toward uh, that powerful energy at the very top oh, no. would be problematic, but two is definitely a problem. Yep, uh, Oranguru also a favorite of Tord and not going to be accessible at the top of the prize cards. Lucas, one of the boss's orders along with one of those Luminion. Suppose that's why you play two. Uh, even with one price, you still have access to the other resource, which is pretty great. But we did see two of his four copies of Collapse Stadium. So that's probably part of why Lucas was so successful this weekend at the Lugia International Championships. 
because the collapse stadium can be very problematic. Well, we are underway. We see the fist bump, and sure enough, we are going to have some incredible action here from both of these players. Looks like we get to see Tordoreklov starting things off here with the amazing rare Evital. You must be feeling really good here if you're Tord winning that coin flip in the Lugia Mirror match. Such a huge thing, and it's going to be on Lucas to really try and turn things around. And I think out of all the Pokemon you want to start with, Stoutland is at the very last of your list. Absolutely, yeah. Even if you start with any of those uh, extra Pokemon that you play in the deck, those Dunsparces and those Manaphys, at least it's only one prize card that you're going to be uh, giving to your opponent. Sure enough, this Stoutland V is going to give two prize cards, and there's no real way to move it off of the field unless you are able to get five Pokemon onto your bench and then use that Collapse Stadium, as we were talking about earlier. Indeed, that's probably going to be Lucas's best way, but with the hefty retreat cost of Stoutland V, I think it's going to be very difficult to prevent that potential KO. Now, Lucas's way to try and stop Tord from setting up, he might not know how many copies of Stoutland, I mean, uh, Collapse Stadium, he will be playing. So if Tord ends up overbenching here a little bit, that could be a little costly. So we'll have to see if he chooses to bench that double Lugia that we've seen a lot, even when going first. Yeah, we do see the capture energy. And of course, you'd love to target down that Lugia V to start things off. But Tord likely looking for a familiar friend in that Oranguru, and that will not be an option this time around. And you do need to be wary of how many Pokemon are on your bench in situations like this. And uh, if you do need one of those support Pokemon, like the Luminion, to perhaps uh, continue to uh, keep this train moving and maybe get some Archeops into the discard pile, only leaves one other bench space, I suppose, and uh, you kind of have to leave that open. Yeah, very important here for Tord to be checking out which cards he prized and probably realizing that those powerful energies are not available to him just yet. He does have one in his hand, but he must know that there's two in the prize cards. Usually, when playing Lugia, you want to make sure you check how many energies you have at your disposal so that you're not anticipating different plays and all of a sudden you can't access those plays because your cards are locked in the prize cards. Well, we do see a relatively strong hand here. Just uh, the decision, I suppose, is do you want to start playing down a lot of these cards or do you hold them for next turn, play it a little slower, and you have an opportunity to uh, barrage your opponent with these Evolution, Incense, Ultra Ball, Double Archaeops, throw them away with the Professor's Research and have the Lugia V-Star in hand. I suppose one awkward part of this is you have a powerful energy in hand and you're going to have to likely play that down and get maximum use of it when you know the two are in the prize cards. Certainly. The reason why you would hesitate here is because you can't, or uh, Tord doesn't have access to the double Archives discard, it's just one. So you have to evaluate whether if you play this Evolution Incense now, you're getting an Archives out of the deck and then you will be able to discard it uh, this turn with this Ultra Ball. However, if you do this now, then you're getting an Archeops out of the deck. That means you won't top deck one, and you will not be able to discard both. So even though you're helping yourself, you're also slightly reducing those chances. And if your opponent decided to Marnie you, then um, that play would be out of commission. But we are seeing toward going ahead and making sure that he has at least one Archeops in the discard ball to start off. Yeah, this is certainly a hedge against the Marnie play. You, you want to make sure that uh, you at least have one of those Archeops in the discard pile, and we know that the Professor's Research certainly could leave this second Archeops in the discard pile on the second turn. And uh, that seems like a pretty strong play. It, it also hints to, to Lucas that there's a little more play in this hand. The uh, Ultra Ball didn't directly go for a Luminion, so certainly something good in that hand, and now it's up to Lucas to find some answers. Exactly, now I'll have to see if Lucas can get those very same Archeopses in the discard pile. One big difference between Tord's and Lucas's decks are the fact that Lucas only plays two copies of Lugia V-Star rather than three. So the chance of him pulling off that turn to Summoning Star slightly lower than Tord's. Both players do have four Evolution Incense and do have four Ultra Balls. But certainly if Lucas ended up prizing one Lugia V-Star at any point in any of these three games, that could end up being a differential between these two players at the highest level of play. 
Yeah, I suppose we do see some of the choices in the deck list also hinting towards uh, not going terribly aggressive and potentially discarding one of those Lugia V-Stars. We still only see the two professors research in the list, so looking for a more consistent strategy with uh, the multiple Luminion and searching out for the right supporter at the right time, and that can definitely lead to one of those turn one Marnies. A lot of mind games could come into play as well with both players playing Manaphy and neither player playing Raikou, but that doesn't mean they know that from their opponent. So we could see a, an attempt at timing the Manaphy with, um, to protect from a Raikou play, but then neither player needs to worry about that. And we are going to see the Marnie from Lucas. Yeah, this seems like a very uh, solid strategy to, to go with here. We are going to see at least the powerful energy coming down here, and maybe that's also a nod to a potential uh, large knockout with the Stoutland if nothing comes from this hand for Tord. Yeah, this Marnie is especially strong here because Tord did give Lucas the information in the previous turn that his hand was incredibly good. So now Lucas responds with that Marnie, trying to decrease the chances that Tord can't pull off that turn to Summoning Star. However, with that hand, I do believe Tord will be able to do that, will probably lead with Table Tell attacking and get this prize initiative started. Do you see in the hand the collapsed stadium? Certainly something to think about, but Lucas would be limiting his bench as well. Just the two slots available for Archeops if possible. Tord does have um, an interesting decision here on which supporter to grab off of that Ultra Ball. He does not have access to that second Archeops just yet, and the double turbo in his hand does not help Evil Tall get ready. If he chose to play with a single Archeops, then he needs one of the copies of Aurora Energy or Hiding Energy along with double Archeops to be able to pull this off. So one Archeops even though it would allow Tord to start getting energies onto his side of the field, it would not allow him to really get that prize initiative going. Well, we've seen Tord have to make some unfortunate decisions, I suppose, with these Ultra Balls, going to lose out on that double turbo. But uh, as you were mentioning, not terribly beneficial here for the Evital just yet. Luminion going to use that luminous sign to search out the professor's research and hopefully assist Tord in uh, using that summoning star this turn. Yeah, Tord does need to draw a way to find Archeops into his hand and a way to discard it as well. Just getting the Archeops would not be good enough, so we're going to see this research and the Lugia bench, possibly. Um, if the Collapse Stadium had been played by Lucas, then that would definitely be a big no-no from Tord, but he still has that little bit of room, but he chooses not to. Yeah, we're going to see the one Lugia V-Star strategy this time around, and this is something that we've been talking about in the mirror. When you go first, uh, sometimes you only need the one Lugia V-Star to get the ball rolling. It was a little bit awkward when you have the Evital already in the active position. Uh, you don't have that Pokemon to use as a surprise factor, but certainly in this matchup, when you have the Luminion ready to go, uh, you have to think that you'll be in these exchanges. Now, Tor did get everything he needs to get that second Archeops in the discard pile, but it is going to be very costly. He needs to Ultra Ball for that Archeops, attach the Aurora Energy to then discard the Archeops, but his hand is also a little bit less than good because he doesn't have any follow-up supporter, so he's down to the cards that he has access to right now and his supporters as well. Yep. Potentially, with the counts, Tord may know that there's an opportunity in the prize cards for some assistance. Uh, you do have two prize cards staring right at you with that Stoutland V if you are able to take this knockout with the Amazing Rare Evital. And sure enough, we will see that Archeops uh, going to the hand here and likely finding the bench very soon. Yeah, Tord double-checking his energy to make sure that he has access to all the ones that he needs in order to follow this up after he's probably already planning for his next turn as well. It's not good enough to just be thinking about, well, I'm taking this knockout and then sit back and relax. You do need to follow up with something, and there's the attachment to the Charizard as a follow-up to the potential Lugia V-Star from Lucas. 
Yeah, we see Tord making use of this energy attachment onto the Radiant Charizard, but it does open up a little bit of awkwardness here with the Collapse Stadium. We know that that Luminion is a, a great choice as an attacker, and at this point, what Pokemon would you even choose to get rid of with a Collapse Stadium? Yeah, I mean, you could maybe argue the Lukia V-Star with um, the knowledge that you do have two powerful energies in your prize cards and you don't know exactly when you're going to find them, even if you find one right now, which Tord will probably do because one of them is at the bottom of the prize cards, that third powerful energy could be a big loss in the prize card. So, yeah, I think there's definitely merit to keeping the Luminion, even though it would be um, an immediate discard from a lot of players because Luminion can shuffle itself back into the deck and not only remove itself as a liability, but also uh, does enough damage to KO the opponent's evil tall or potential Charizard, I think there's a lot of merit to conserving that Luminion still. Well, it looks like we are lined up here for the amazing destruction from this Evital. An incredible attack, only really finding play here because of Archeops and the Summoning Star ability from Lugia. And that is going to be the first prize cards here in the Latin America International Championship as Tord is going to take two prize cards off the board. And speaking of Luminion, that seems to be Lucas's choice for attacker right here. It does seem like he has enough in his hand to pull off the double Archeops as well and gets that Luminion out of here whilst taking a prize card and eliminating a threat. But Tord with the Charizard already ready to go. Lucas will also need to bench a Pokemon essentially to sacrifice after this Luminion has attacked. Well, it looks like Orangaroo is up for the task. We are going to see this professor's research and that is going to toss away the Archeops and the uh, looks like the Collapse Stadium as well. So uh, maybe Lucas just wanting to see a little bit more before making this choice. It is uh, nicer to play this card once you already see your Archeops down. Yeah, that Collapse Stadium, as we've seen it help players, we've also seen it take um, make it a little more complicated for them to get their double Archeops into play. So Lucas choosing not to make sure that he has all the bench space for any potential attackers and any potential sacrificial Pokemon that he'll need after this Luminion attack. Well, we see Luminion getting charged up and the Archeops is going to go back in. Number two here is potentially going to eye up some energies for uh, perhaps a Retreater, or we could even see the Lugia start to get rolling too. And it looks like uh, Orangaroo says, oh, I'll help out. Interesting to see that V-Guard energy onto the Oranguru that makes it so that, um, I mean, Lugia V-Star can get the KO. Luminion was never getting the KO, but Tord is saying, okay, if you go and boss my Lugia or boss my Archeops, I already have a Retreater ready to go for my next attacker. So very good um, preparation for Lucas for his upcoming turn. And I did want to make a mention that we just saw the Heat Fire energy from Lucas get shuffled back into the deck. Tord chose Hiding Energy as his energy of choice, so both players only playing 4 Aura and 1 extra energy to be able to attack with either Charizard or Evil Tall, and I'm sure that extra HP that Heat Fire Energy provides to Charizard must have become useful at some point for Lucas in his run. Yeah, you can, you can see that potentially in the mirror if the Luminion isn't available. Maybe the Archeops gets rolling and we see multiple powerful energies, and maybe they're just 10 short because they didn't check which special energies you're holding. Now, Tord really trying to figure out what his best game plan is here. Does he commit to an Archeops for the single price trade? Does he commit a Lugia knowing that a powerful energy is still in the price cards, even though he just unlocked one? And he also knows that his Luminion is in play. He doesn't have access to Ranguru and he doesn't have any draw supporters. So the cards he has right now are probably the ones that he'll have to use. However, of course, as I say that, he top decks that Marnie. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's usually how it goes here, and Dord is going to go ahead and look through uh, to see what energies should be accelerated in this circumstance. Certainly don't need to, nothing too impressive here. I do believe there's just the one powerful uh, floating around, unless we got one off of the prize cards. Yeah, he does have one in his, in his hand from the prize cards. There is one more in his deck, and I do believe we saw one uh, discarded earlier on. So... 
at Rangaroos 120 HP, it shouldn't be a problem for this Lugia to take down. The question is, that double turbo, is there any merit to it to be able to attack with Archeops later on? Even potentially Luminion if it wants to take out a Radiant Charizard with very minimal energy investment. Um, but we are seeing the attachment of the double turbo and the powerful here to fulfill the attack cost. Yeah, I was almost just looking at powerful energy as uh, an any energy at this point because I don't think we saw much left in towards deck. A lot of energies were used uh, with that Evital taking a huge knockout and we saw at least two energies that were discarded in getting the setup rolling here. So Tor does have some uh, in the hand, so we will at least see that capture energy to fulfill uh, the attack cost for this Lugia. Of course, even if you don't want to uh, use this capture energy, you got to shuffle. Yeah, usually when you attack with Evil Tall, you want to use one of your copies of Double Turbo as it doesn't do damage, so you're not really reducing anything from its potential, and you make a little bit more energy efficient your attack, but Tord was forced to power it up fully with the five total energies, and here we see the Marnie disrupting Lucas and probably trying to lower the chances that Lucas has the best potential response, which at this point would probably be a Radiant Charizard with a choice built. Yeah, that would be phenomenal. I'm not sure if the reach is there with the powerful energies and the uh, potential choice belt necessary in order to take a knockout uh, with a Lugia V-Star of his own. We'll see if Lucas is going to focus on that, and that we do see the promotion here of the Lugia V-Star. And with Tord's lack of B-Guard energy, Lucas doesn't have to go out of his way to really get this KO. He's already holding the choice belt that he's about to attach now. He only needs two powerful energies in order to get the KO along with that double turbo. So um, he is staring down a Radiant Charizard though, so Lucas has to be aware of that and he needs to account for it. Looks like a tough decision here for Lucas, potentially holding two double turbos in hand along with uh, that final Professor's Research. If you want to go through the deck any further, you might have to make a tough call or play one of these energies uh, so somewhere you don't want to. Yeah, there's two powerful energies being attached by Archeops. Which are the other energies? Will he commit to all of them or will he choose to use the double turbos from his hand? Looks like he's eyeing up the capture and the powerful. I do feel like there's a lot of merit to keeping that capture. Uh, still available to be able to find a backup Pokemon, but he does commit two of them right here. Oh, that probably means we'll see the double turbo down to the Archeops at some point, just considering a speed wing or even a retreat at some point to get to one of those larger attackers, that Radiant Charizard that you were mentioning. But, oh, we're going to actually see it to the discard pile, both of those going down and toward. Uh, his eyes widened a little bit there. Yeah, he had to double check that that card behind the Lugia to make sure he was seeing those two double turbos. And this might beg the question for Tord, is he playing a third one? Is he playing a copy of Twin? Or how does he follow up this Lugia KO? Which attacker will he focus on? Well, it looks like the hand was already drawn and Lucas is going to go ahead and take the knockout now on that Lugia V-Star with Tempest Dive going down to a 3-3 prize cards. Yeah, both players died, but Tord already has the response with that choice build. That's the big card that sometimes you have to dig for, but Tord very, very well prepared for this, uh, making sure that no Marnie would catch him off guard from Lucas. Of course, that didn't happen, but neither player is playing a way, sorry, Lucas isn't playing a way to remove tools. Tord is playing a copy of Lost Vacuum, I believe. So we'll have to see which energy Tord commits here. And that will leave Tord at one prize card remaining. It is the powerful energy. But what is Tord's follow-up? He doesn't have a Lugia in play. Therefore, no Lugia V-Star yet. He does, he's already exhausted the Evil Tell option. He'll probably lose the Charizard option this upcoming turn. So how does Tord close out this game? Uh, that's a great point because I think Tord is very low on energies. Unless he's holding uh, a couple additional energies in hand, it's likely going to have to be the powerful energy from the prize card along with uh, one of those last double turbo energies. And that really only leaves 
Uh, Pokemon like Archeops potentially as an attacker. Hopefully there is an Aurora energy and maybe a Luminion can uh, help out in this circumstance. There's probably an opportunity where Tord could get two attacks off as long as this uh, Luminion isn't targeted and surely you have to think that Radiant Charizard will be the focus for Lucas here. Now Lucas did prepare very well for this situation. I do believe he still has access to two powerfuls. No, never mind. I only see one in his hand. He's going for that Serena. We could see a choice belt Serena KO onto the Luminion on the bench. I would put Lucas at one price card, but that would reset towards Charizard attack. And Tord would only need a Serena or boss to take down one of Lucas's benched Pokemon. So I'm not quite sure what Lucas's best response here is. It could be just attacking with Luminion as well, eliminate that Charizard, remove that liability, but then he needs something to withstand Tord's next attack. Well, we will see what that means as Tord is going to be very low on energies at this point. Lucas has to be aware, uh, seeing the, the discard pile at some point and uh, two additional energies along with one of these big threats and some hand disruption should be able to help out in this spot. Very interesting for Lucas here. He needs to draw an energy to attach to the Arceus, but he cannot draw all the energies. He still needs one left in his deck to finish powering up the Luminion. And I don't think I see an energy in his hand. That means the Arceus can retreat, but it cannot power up the Luminion for its final third energy. Yeah, it's a little unfortunate. Of course, we did see the Archeops uh, used first to try to get some of these energies in play, but the second one was held, and sure enough, just not able to see one of those energies, perhaps wanting to draw first, but now just going to pass the turnover. The game is not done just yet. The Charizard is not able to attack unless it is able to reach the bench. Switching effects are not in this list right now, uh, but is this a potential opening here for Tord to close things out here in game number one. Lucas must be thinking, why did I use that first Archeops ability? He still had a bunch of energy left. The chance of him drawing all of them were so, so low. He would have needed to draw all Aurora energy. So perhaps using that Archeops ability preemptively might have been his mistake last turn. Tord is going to download as much information as possible, looking through the discard pile and seeing a fair amount of energies, but not enough to explain last turn. And uh, toward also considering what attack, if any, do you go for at this point? It's awkward to, to try to find a retreat. This Radiant Charizard has a three retreat cost. Is there an opportunity maybe to, to buy some time here? Uh, and keep this Radiant Charizard with an opportunity to take a knockout on the following turn. As far as I can tell, there's only two energies left in Tord Reckless deck, so even though Lucas missed an attack, I'm not sure if Tord can get back-to-back -back attacks here at all. How does Tord close out the last prize card? He commits one last energy to the Radiant Charizard. Is he going to re treat perhaps, but then that would eliminate the Aurora energy. I'm not exactly sure what is going to happen here. He might have one more Aurora energy left. That's the only thing that I can really see at this point, uh, but we are going to see the Marnie come down, which means that that card could potentially be drawn, so uh, I do worry about that situation. But if there were the Aurora and the double turbo, you could see the Luminion attack, and then those energies would be available for the following turn. Just try to boss's orders, target down that Archeops one last time and close things out here. Uh, Radiant Charizard going to the bench now. Archeops promotion, and that's going to be a pass. The resources are so low here. Both of these decks are so good, both of these decks are so powerful, but both players have missed an attack so far. Now Lucas is holding a bunch of energies in his hand, but no way to bring up that Radiant Charizard. So if Tord does have that last Aurora, that does mean that every energy will have put in the work for Tord, and he will be taking his last prize card with his last energy. Yeah, it looks like... Uh, we are going to just see the fist bump there. Maybe Lucas has an understanding of what is left in Tord's deck. If the Aurora energy was there, then the Radiant Charizard would likely be able to close things out. And he 
we'll uh, see if we can get some official confirmation on this before we jump into game number two. But uh, it certainly does look like that was a concession there from the Leafs. Yeah, and Lucas did concede right here, then Ford is up one game. Like I said, I'm not sure if Ford had that last Aurora available. I think he did, and that was how he was going to close out the game. We didn't realize that without a cross border, it was going to be impossible to prevent that charge from taking the last price target. Look at the attack, he was in trouble. If look at this attack, then he was also in trouble. Well, once again, the resource management continually a trend as we uh, we talk about that time and time again here on the big stage and uh, toward Reckla trying to make the most of every single card in this deck, the consistency in the beginning, and of course, uh, even making those uh, intricate plays there with the Ultra Balls, just making the decision of if I'm able to lose these energies, will I have enough to close out the game? Even felt comfortable after uh, five energies were on that Evitol and was knocked out, uh, finding enough to potentially close out here. Yeah, and this shows how a lot of people are saying how Lugia is super, super good and might be too good even. However, we are seeing the intricacies of the matchup. You, it's not good enough to just get your two archives out and start using all your energies and powering up whatever attacker you have. You really need to make every single energy count. Well, we do have official word from the judge. Tor did win that opening game as we do, like we likely suspected. Lucas just didn't have the resources to close thing out close this thing out here and we're going to see what Lucas has now in the prize cards for game number two. We saw this was a little bit unfortunate with one of those Luminions last time around but certainly uh, playable. Would uh, hate to see the uh, one of these Lugia V-Stars in the prize cards as we know that just two are in the deck and that would be very difficult to find summoning star on the second turn. Indeed, I do have the benefit of being able to look at Lucas's hand right here and he is holding one Lugia V-Star right now. So at least one of those is safe from the price card. He will be able to access that, and unless Tord is able to Marty him, then Lucas should be able to get his setup, especially after this couple of mulligans from Tord. Well, of course, you can't be counted out in situations like this. It was an unfortunate start there for Lucas going into uh, the opening of this championship match. Starting with that Stoutland V, going second, and uh, staring at the blonde hair of Tord Reckliff. Those are all bad things to see. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we've seen define these Lugia Mirror matches is whether a player starts with a knockout on a two prizer or a single prizer. And we've seen players who end up losing that first prize because they went second, still able to make comebacks in the prize trade off. The player who takes the first knockout on a single prizer is probably committing at least three of their very valuable energies. And since every energy has to count, that has been a reason for either player to take a win. Well, looks like we will see the V-Guard energy in the prize cards for Lucas, along with that Orangaroo. Little uh, reversal of fortunes here from the prize cards of game number one. And Tord, with the consistency of all of these counts, will not be affected by some of those prize cards, as we do see one of the Lugia Vs there. Yeah, one Archips as well, prize for Tord, but because he is playing the four copies, that wouldn't be super, super impactful. If he were playing three, though, then he'd only have exactly two left to get exactly two into play. Now we are seeing Lucas lead with that capture energy, so he'll be checking his energies, checking which attackers are available, and if there's any key cards that he needs to account for when preparing for his plays. Yeah, we've, we've seen uh, cards like this, this effect uh, in the Pokemon TCG many times before. Just being able to uh, find basic Pokemon and this opening deck search uh, also needs to be valued as well. It's uh, so important to the consistency of these builds. And sure enough, Lucas is going to get plenty of information right now as we do see the notes being taken here. And that is also something these players are welcome to do uh, on the big stage. And speaking of all uh, similar effects of older cards, I can't tell you, Kyle, how many times I've called Capture Energy Call Energy <laughs> in all of my videos and live streams. It's just, I, it's ingrained in me, so. Yeah, the, uh, the Call Energy was one of our favorites as uh, we played in the SP era of this, uh, the Pokemon TCG. It's a little bit of a different effect, but uh, it was definitely uh, as impactful. 
Now Lucas very aggressively discarding double Lugia here in order to fetch that Archeops, recognizing that he's probably not going to be using more than one Lugia V-Star this game, and actually going for that Stoutland, making sure that he has the option to potentially get two prize cards off of that evil tall. Well, this is uh, certainly looking like a strong start there for Lucas. Don't have to worry about seeing just the one Lugia V. We've mentioned this before. Uh, when you go first, you just need one, really. And uh, obviously, the build speaks to that as Lucas is just playing the two Lugia V star. So uh, looking to just get the summoning star down and uh, get the rest of the puzzle pieces lined up afterwards. Now we do see Lucas holding a boss's orders and a Lugia V star. So that probably means that he could target towards Reckliff. Single Lugia, if that's all he was able to get into play. So the pressure is on Tor to get those two Lugia Vs out. And if that does happen, then Lucas also gave himself the option to potentially power up that Stutland with four powerful energy and lead the way with a two prize KO on the Evil Tall. That would certainly be a disaster here for Tord Reckliff and all of his fans. But we do see that the opening energy here is the capture. The Lugia is found, and you have to think that maybe in this hand there has to be some of that consistency. The four quick ball, the four ultra ball, or even uh, two of those Lugias that are still around with the other in the prize cards. Indeed, I do fully expect Tor to make sure that he's fully prepared for that worst case scenario of Lucas holding a Lugia V-Star and a boss and making sure that he's ready for that by benching another Lugia. But as we've mentioned before, bench space is quite, quite important. We are going to see that Marnie, though. Oh. So taking away that boss from Lucas, but also putting himself at risk to where his last resort of getting that second Lugia down to prevent that worst case scenario. Yeah, uh, at the least, uh, Lucas is down that uh, Lugia V-Star along with the boss's orders, so uh, that will be on the bottom of the deck, but did Tord find what he needs? Tord did not find another way to bench a second Lugia V, so it's on Lucas to be able to capitalize on this. Now, with Lucas's hand currently, I don't think he'll be able to, which is a little unfortunate. I, uh, this might actually be possible. I think we saw the evolution in sense along with the Ultra Ball. If the target is potentially uh, the Luminion, uh, there is an additional evolution in sense for that Lugia V Star. He could full commit to this play and just leave himself with no hand, but I think that we could see this Lugia go down. All right. As, I, as soon as I was saying that, he top decked that Ultra <laughs> Ball. <laughs> so once again, my analysis being undermined by a player's top decks. But here we are, goes for the Serena very well. We might even see a quick concession by Tord, recognizing that he's going to fall really far behind, but he'll probably also get a sort of read that maybe Lucas doesn't have a lot to follow this up, so Tord might stick in this to try and make this comeback. Yeah, at, at the very least for Lucas, even if the prize cards aren't helpful here, we do see the Luminion is down. That is a Pokemon that could potentially take prize cards. The Evital is down as well. That could take upwards of two prize cards. So you can see that the exchanges would still be favored for Lucas and many opportunities to find a card uh, like a supporter in the prizes uh, is available. And we are going to see that quick ball. We know that there are multiple copies of Luminion and at least one bench space right now. So Lucas in a fantastic spot here in game number two. That worst case scenario did happen and Tord missed all his outs to the second Lugia. He had a capture energy, I believe, in his hand, but he's choosing not to commit to that. He's just going to Marty, delay Lucas, I mean, give Lucas extra cards as he was only holding three of them after taking the two prize cards. And Tord does find another capture and a quick wall. So this is the turn where he could bench double Lugia finally. But is it a little bit too late? Yeah, you're going to see the, the commitment here is, is, is you're asking so much. Uh, Tord needs a, a lot of opportunities. And sure enough, his opponent just played their entire hand and knocked out the only Lugia. And you have to give them four cards in, in return in order to stay in this game. And all the prize cards are now uh, available here for Lucas in just two turns as we see the multiple Lugia V in play. Hort, it's very telling how he just threw the Lugia B into play, being like, dude, you're one turn too late. <laughs> Lucas doesn't do much during his turn, though, as commits an energy and takes a knockout on that evil doll. 
Yeah, the, uh, when you see n none of the Archaeops abilities used, maybe you consider that uh, your opponent could be holding something relevant, but also uh, would you also just uh, try to go for one of those V knockouts uh, at that time? So maybe no gusting effect, but certainly uh, something relatively okay in the hand. We'll have to see. Now Tord is staring down both a Lugia V-Star and an almost powered up Evil Tal, so he knows that this Lugia V-Star will certainly be going down next turn. And it's on Lucas to find that last resort to take a prize card. But unlike the previous game, which was really back and forth, Lucas has been extremely efficient with the use of his energies. He hasn't invest he has not invested too many resources into getting those KOs. And yeah, toward throwing away the cards, <laughs> knowing he's so far behind that it's gonna be really difficult to pull this off. But you never know, maybe Lucas ends up whiffing something, or maybe Lucas ends up making a mistake at some point that allows Thor to make this comeback. Yes, quite literally throwing away this Archaeops into uh, the eventual discard pile. Orangaroo going to uh, at least get a card out of the deck, and we see the evolution in sense here. Once more, uh, powerful energies are going to be the friend of Tord Reklov here as uh, he eyes down a potential knockout here with the Lugia V-Star, but just going to continually uh, start to thin down the deck and get these Archaeops into the correct place. Turns out a turn four double Archaeops is way less good than a turn two, so we're going to see Tord really have to delay this. But, okay, one way he could start trying to make this comeback would be taking a knockout with a single prizer on this two prizer. However, I did not see a choice build in Tord's hand, so I'm not so sure that's even possible this turn. Yeah, and with Lucas at uh, even just the three prize cards, it means that at any time, if one of those V Pokemon were to fall after a single prizer, uh, this could be a disaster. But you, you do start to wonder if if this Lugia v, uh, v Star could stick around for an additional turn, would Tord have an opportunity? Looks like that door would be closed pretty quickly with the Amazing Rare Evital. I'm sure if Lucas had access to his V-Guard energy, who would have attached it to the Lugia, making it even more complicated for Tord to achieve this knockout, forcing the choice build, which is so, so crucial. But unfortunately, it's still in his prize cards. Tord will be able to finally get his attack off, get his first two prize cards, but Lucas ready to go with the response. Well, that hand was not very great. <laughs> A lot of... Uh and awkward cards to be seen, but we will see the Archaeops assisting by pulling some of these energies uh, out of the deck, and Ivatol should be prepared to take the knockout here on the Lugia V-Star. We are going to see that additional energy onto the Archaeops. Thinking of uh, potential retreating as Lucas will be eyeing down just one more prize card after this turn. There's nothing Tord can do here other than deal with the Evil Tal and then hope Lucas doesn't have a KO. Not just one turn, but two turns as Tord will only be taking one prize card and will have three remaining. He immediately promotes the Lugia. It is the bulkiest attacker, the one with the most HP. Charizard right here could be eliminated quite simply by a Luminion. So Tord trying to force the most out of Lucas, trying to make him need the most amount of cards in order to get this response. Yeah, we see the, the high hit points of the Lugia V-Star potentially uh, going to keep Tord around here. Could take the knockout, and then maybe we could see uh, some plays where you use the Luminion and try to bounce around into these Archaeops, take advantage of the hit points that are there. 150 can be uh, a difficult number uh, at times for Lucas to find. The big advantage for Lucas right now is that he doesn't need to win this turn. He could still not get what he needs this particular turn and still have an extra turn to do so. So he's eyeing those energies. We might even see an attack with the Archips as we are seeing right now, setting up that two-hit KO, but we do see the boss for game as we head into game number three. Yep, little uh, Archaeops on Archaeops action as the knockout is going to come down there and we see Lucas taking the victory here in game number two and what a way to have it. We are going to be moving on to game number three here in the championship match of Latin America. So far we've seen both super consistent lists going first and building on big advantages that end up being insurmountable for their opponents. So now all the pressure is on Lucas, who is now going second and needs to get this comeback. He needs either Tord to not get that turn to Archives, or he'll, or he'll need to figure out a way 
to make his attackers more efficient than Tord's. And starting with a non-V Pokémon will be Lucas's first goal here. Yeah, Pablo, take us into the mind of these players as they're both shuffling up, understanding everything that's at stake. They're trying to... Uh, obviously, they want to see the best hand possible. They're trying to not see that Stoutland V or anything like that anymore. How do you keep your composure in a situation like this? So, there's a lot of pressure coming into these matches. Now you're in game three. I generally think what you need to be thinking and focusing on is I just need my deck to do what it has done the whole tournament. It's taking me all the way here. I just needed to perform that one last time well enough. That's what I'm thinking about. I just want to see a good seven cards because then that really gives you the confidence that you need to make sure that you can head into the match with as much confidence as possible. Well, we at the desk are hoping for the same thing. I'm sure everybody out in the crowd is looking to see two incredible hands as we would love to see a fantastic finale here for the Masters Division as two incredible players are trying to be crowned champion. I really want to see this back and forth that Lugia Mirrors have shown us throughout the course of this tournament, even though it does seem like the player who goes first has a big advantage. It usually leads to very exciting games when both players set up, both players get their double archives out, and it becomes a management of resources and decision-making that we saw in game one. Well, we see a head nod from Tord Reklev. I've got a peek at Lucas's hand. I'm excited to see what these players have and go ahead and throw the Stoutland V at the very top of the prize cards toward. You're not going to be needing that, likely. Lucas did start with Evil Tull, amazing rare this time around, so that's step number one. Prizing two capture energies right here, so that could be problematic, but he does have the boss's orders at the bottom, so that could end up being a factor for a follow-up play in the beginning. But Lucas not choosing to start the Evil Tull, choosing to start a Lugia V. Yeah, that's a, a pretty interesting call. We've seen a lot of the time, if you go second, you like to start with a, a Pokemon that only is going to give up one prize card. It keeps you in the, the prize exchange, and uh, you often worry that uh, this Lugia V would be knocked out, and your opponent could potentially take four prize cards very early in the game if they find momentum. Now, Lugas did get a really, really good hand to lead into the Double Archives discard plus Luminion. It seems like Tord's hand is also quite, quite good, and Tord already has a Lugia in play, doesn't have to worry about getting a second one, and has the capture energy to look through his deck, realize exactly which resources he has access to, and I believe he also has the possibility to discard two Archives in this very first turn, so we are going to see at least both players fully set up and go into the swing of things. This is going to be fantastic, exactly what we love to see here. Even uh, toward eyeing up the Oranguru, which could potentially help shore up this hand here. We did see a lot of those resources, which could help out with getting the Archeops into the discard pile. But we, we saw a card like Boss's Orders, which is something which would be so helpful for promoting the Lukia, but you're already staring at it in the active spot. Yeah, those two prizes will be very important for Tord if he manages to find that KO in his second turn. Lucas will also need to have the response ready, but I think Luminion will really showcase its strength here because both players will probably be utilizing it on their second turn or Lucas even on his first turn to be able to set up. So Luminion being a big factor in this finals, and it gives me a little bit of nostalgia for that NAIC finals where we saw Tord playing the four Tapuleles. We are seeing the importance of having that possibility to search for something with your four Quick Balls and four Ultra Balls. They essentially become supporters themselves. Yeah, this is uh, exactly what Tord loves to see, the consistency of the deck shining as all of these resources are in his hand and has so many options in how to play this out. Uh, love to see that Quick Ball, that Capture Energy as well. Just uh, going to leave uh, plenty of opportunities uh, for cards like Luminion to help out in the next turn. Now, toward having to discard that boss's orders right here does mean he will not have access to that resource at the end of the game where you might need to gust a single price Pokemon, a Pokemon that your opponent is preparing to attack, such as the Radiant Charizard, as Serena cannot target that. So having access to only one boss's orders throughout the rest of the game could end up being a differential in this finals match where the simplest and smallest of things because these two players are so evenly matched in their skill can end up being the reason why one player loses or wins. 
Yep, both players are playing the split, two boss's orders and two of the Serena. So uh, it is nice to have that opportunity to pull up the one prize Pokemon, but also in situations like this, maybe you are going to be the aggressor and it's on Lucas to be able to find those opportunities to uh, take the uh, the prize cards off of the bench. We do know that that one boss's orders is in the prizes for Lucas, but at the bottom that might be a little more uh, helpful here, as we could see that in the the middle of this this game. Very smartly, Tord uses Oranguru to guarantee that the Luminion is at the top of his deck, making sure that even if Lucas tried to disrupt him with Marnie, he would at the very least have a guaranteed supporter. As at this point, I think both players can very safely assume that neither player is playing a copy of Path to the Peak here. Yep, love to see that. Having uh, the perfect opportunity to make whatever play necessary uh, will help uh, take the advantage here for Tord. Lucas is going to go ahead and toss away one of these Archaeops and uh, certainly looking for a little more play here, but the hand did look promising. Yeah, both players had pretty good hands starting off here, so the only thing making a difference here is the fact that Lucas went second, so he will be losing that Lugia on turn one. I don't imagine, even though Tor does have a boss's orders in his hand, he won't be able to capitalize on that unless Lucas for some reason chose not to bench a second Lugia, which he's already holding. So there's no way at this stage he's going to be making that mistake. We're going to see a straight up Luminion for research to try and find a better hand. Yep, there's uh, also the opportunity to maybe go for this Marnie, as it looks like. Uh, Lucas may just want to find some disruption, but uh, as we know, the uh, Orangaroo is certainly uh, not going to let that happen, and uh, sure enough, we do see that Professor's research going to be helpful here. There's definitely merit to the Marnie, but knowing that Tord has the Orangaroo and did use Primate Wisdom, you have to assume Tord did put that Luminion at the very top. If Tord had not done that, then there might have been more merit to that Marnie, quite simply because um, with Tord having the Luminion in his hand, it would have been put directly into the bottom of the deck. But it's certainly the card that Lucas can predict. It's at the very top. It's an educated guess he can do. And we are going to see the read the win for extra cards right here. Yep, the discard of the Stoutland for three cards. I think that's a trade that both of these players would take at any time. Now, Tord has a very interesting decision to make here. He knows Lucas has a lot of cards in his hand, seven if I'm not mistaken. And Tord can choose to go for the Marnie to disrupt Lucas, but he doesn't have the Lugia V-Star yet. And it quite simply might come down to the fact that seven cards is bigger than five, therefore maximizing the possibilities to get that Lugia V-Star in play, utilize Summoning Star, and get the two Arcubuses. Even though you might want to disrupt your opponent's big hand, the most important thing and the thing that will let you get ahead and start capitalizing on the advantage that you got by choosing to go first will be maximizing your chances on getting out that Lukia V-Star. So I cannot imagine that Tord will really care too much of, even if Lucas had 12 cards in his hand. We do see that Tord has the uh, attachment for the turn of that capture energy, and I think this will really speak wonders to what the strategy is here, as we can clearly see that the Lugia V star that potentially would come out this turn uh, could take the knockout here on the Lugia V, and then what does the prize map look like from there? The Evital could potentially take a knockout on another V Pokemon, and then the Luminion and potentially that Radiant Charizard uh, could be cards to close out, of course. Uh, need to be considerate of the bench space right now as the two Archaeops would love to see play. So after this Luminion is benched, expect to see uh, no additional Pokemon being played other than those Archaeops. A big play that Lucas could utilize to try and take away the advantage that Tord currently has is we can safely predict that Tord will be taking these two prize cards right here and Lucas will be counteracting that with the Evil Tull that he already has down. And if Evil Tull does have the V-Guard energy attached, that would prevent Luminion from taking it down, possibly forcing Tord to utilize one of his very valuable Archipses, or even Evil Tull itself, to take down Lucas's Evil Tull. So that could be a play Lucas could try to make in order to come back from this as Tord slams that Lugia V-Star into play. Yep, that is one play that Lucas has available that Tord does not, as the V-Guard energy is not featured in Tord Reckless list. 
Very good. See that V-Star for the double Arceus, Tord ready to go to take this KO. He doesn't need a lot of energy commitments in terms of powerful energy. He definitely cannot afford to use the double turbo unless he also wants to commit one powerful, which would be a little wasteful, or a choice build, which also would be a little wasteful. So we're going to see what exactly he's planning in terms of his resource management. Tord has the initiative. It's on him to make every energy count and make sure that he's getting the most out of every single energy to be able to close out this game. Yeah, we've seen, well, the aesthetically pleasing four capture energies uh, very often from Tord as uh, doesn't value those energies too much later in the mid game. As you've mentioned, that can be relevant. It could help you find a card like a Radiant Charizard at an opportune time, but maybe we will have to see uh, a, one of those uh, Aurora energies or the powerful energies played here. I'm not sure if all four captures are available. Yeah, that's where you have to really know exactly what is priced, what isn't, and also try to predict the future turns. That capture energy, as you just mentioned, has a lot of value, not only as a way to retreat or attack, but also as a way to combo with promoting an Archeops, attaching the capture, searching for the right Pokémon for your next attack without having it in play, because sometimes you need to protect your Pokémon. You can't immediately bench them because they could be targeted by your opponent, so having them in the deck or in your hand prevents that from happening. So Capture Energy has that added value, not only in the early game to help with your consistent setup, but in the late game to combine with a one retreater and getting the right attacker out at the right time. Looks like we do see one of those Capture Energies, and then the decision just becomes, do I value Aurora or Powerful? It looks like Aurora is going to be more valued here as the Powerful Energy is going to come down. Yeah, that powerful energy with Tord not having any sort of Lugia V-Star follow-up right now in play. They do lose value as the game goes on. There's no Stoutland access either. I believe it's already hit the discard ball, so Tord will not be pulling off a quad um, powerful energy attack into KOing the Evil Tall. So, yeah, I think the onus is on Lucas to really make something happen and have Tord miss an attack, the boss's orders in the discard pile will give him a little bit of hope, and I generally think V-Guard Energy Evil Tall is the best follow-up that Lucas could have. Well, we'll see if Lucas has the reach for that on the following turn. Of course, hasn't even seen Alugia V-Star, hasn't had an opportunity to, as this will be the second turn of the game here uh, for Lucas after we see Tord attacking. Tord just going to make sure to set up as best as possible. We see that Aurora Energy coming down onto the Evital, and maybe that does just solidify a little more additional help for next turn, or even hint at the fact that an Archeops may have to attack at some point, as you were mentioning with that Evital. Lucas is holding the Lugia Vista in his hand, which is really good. He's also holding a bunch of energies, and there's the Evil Tall. So in order for him to pull off this V-Card energy, Evil Tall, he will need to commit five energies total onto Evil Tall, which is a big, big ask. But I'm sure that's what he's planning. There's no way um, you could miss, you could make Tord miss an attack. Otherwise, there he checked for that V-Guard, double-checking that it is available to him. We are going to see the quick wall as well. So it's on Tord to have a way to deal with this. And other than Evil Doll, he could commit an Archeops, but then that will limit him to one Archeops for the rest of the game. Well, that is something that Tord is going to have to think about as this Evil Doll is certainly going to be ready to use Amazing Destruction this turn. Lucas did notice that V-Guard energy and likely will be going for that play. We're going to go ahead and see these energies accelerated uh, by way of the Archeops here and uh, likely going to see those the, that V-Guard energy featured, starting off here with the Aurora energies. Yeah, please, Lucas, make me look good right here. Please, <laughs> please, please help me out. There's the third Aurora energy, and there's the V-Guard energy. So that takes Luminion out of commission to be able to get a return KO here. I'm sure Tord will account for this and will evaluate what his best move right here is. Lucas also has two essential liabilities and if you didn't realize about the V-Guard before, if you were Tord, you definitely realize this now. But this is Lucas's also best option, combining this KO with the Marty making it a lot more difficult for Tord to find the perfect response, which could have been a boss's orders plus 
Serena to get the last two KOs on those two Luminions, or quite simply, a different attacker like a regular Lugia or something. So the big tail here is the fact that there's a double Turo. So there's six total energies for Lucas on that Evil Tall. Even though it only needs five, now we're just giving him extra power here. Yeah, we see the Marnie come down, so ultimate disruption along with this huge knockout here as Amazing Destruction will remove the Lugia V-Star from play. We did see both players with a full bench, so you start to wonder maybe if Lucas could find an opportunity to use uh, that Stadium card and help out, but it looks like it was not found there off of the Marnie. Now, Tord did find a Serena off of that Marnie. It seemed like he was going to promote the Evil Doll, so he would have the option to get an extra two prizes right here if he chose. He also has the option to just get rid of this Evil Doll with his own, but that's five energies total committed in order to get rid of a single prize Pokemon. So it's not the best cost-effective way to do this. Yeah, this says maybe starting to look like Lucas has found an opportunity to close down the uh, the path that we see. Typically, when the players go first in this match, they are favored, but uh, Lucas is starting to make this look like a very even match as Tord uh, left in an interesting spot here, promoting the Amazing Rare Evis all and considering playing down all of these energies. Now, Tord... Um, having to start thinking as well as his follow-up, about his follow-up turn, I'm sure he's already planned whether he's going to commit to this KO or he's going to Serena into a KO on Lugia or Luminion. I would imagine Lugia is the bigger threat here, but this is definitely a big turn for Tord. And that Marnie did limit his overall options, but he was able to find that Marnie off of his fifth card of his top deck. And therefore, Tord could respond with disruption on Lucas and this KO, putting the pressure on Lucas to find a response to this evil doll. We'll see if the strategy here for Tord is to just target down V Pokemon and get very aggressive. Uh, of course, leaving a Pokemon like this Amazing Rare Evitol in the active with all of these energies feels awful. Uh, you would just know that a guaranteed knockout is available. But if you can knock out a uh, Pokemon like one of these Luminion or the Lugia V-Star, of course, uh, that just leaves one more gusting effect and uh, potential Radiant Charizard to, to close out on this game. Now, Lucas does have access to that Heat Fire Energy along with one more Aurora Energy to be able to attack with Radiant Charizard at any given point. I believe he also has access still to both his boss's orders and Serena, so that Luminion on the bench could end up on Tord Reckless bench could end up being a determining factor here in the outcome of the game. Uh, Tord committing those energies, I think he's just deciding whether he's going to commit to the Marty or to the Serena KO. Yeah, some options are still available. We see that hiding energy. That means that the retreat is available too. We could potentially still see that Archeops come down with uh, enough energies to take the knockout here. So Tord has opportunities. It just really depends on uh, what he wants to go with. Orangaru going to try to find an additional uh, helpful card here. And we did see the Marnie in hand. I'm so curious to see what supporter is going to be played. Tord holding a collapse stadium as well. There's not much value in that right now because that would just take away one of Lucas's two Luminions, most likely, but he'd still have the option to utilize the other one. Tord committing his energy attachment for a turn onto the Evil Tall, and he's eyeing up the Serena as well. So you have to wonder what is his prize mapping, as you mentioned? Which four prizes is he taking? And if he chooses to take two prizes here, to advance his win condition by leaving only two prizes left. That does leave an Evil Tall fully powered up with six energies, in fact, being able to take down this Evil Tall and giving the same conundrum to Tord in his next turn. Yeah, imagine playing the Serena and you, know, you have this really tough decision. Do you take down all of the hit points of the Lucia V-Star that leaves the Luminions available, but then that opens up avenues where Lucas could play down a Collapse Stadium with five Pokemon, remove a Luminion, and then, of course, Aqua Return for a knockout and remove all of the Vs from play if the Lucia was targeted. Exactly, so a lot of things happening right here, a lot of micro decisions that could end up helping either player or potentially giving them a disadvantage. And each player knows how many resources they each have left. 
but they don't necessarily know the exact amount of resources their opponent has because you have to factor in deck list, knowledge, but also the prize card. So we'll have to see how Tord follows this to hit KO. The Evil Tull will pose the exact same problem. And if Lucas can combine this KO with yet another Marnie, then it could be really, really good for him. It's all in Tord. Like, by doing this, he's saying, well, if I get another boss effect, I'm already going to win this game. That is absolutely what has happened here. Tord Reckliff putting the game on a clock as we will see two prize cards come down, and that is just one V Pokemon knockout away from crowning Tord Reckliff the champion if he has the cards in hand to do so. And if we don't consider any gust effects, Tord will be taking two prizes here, needing two more attacks if he has to deal with two single prizes. However, Lucas very promptly promotes that Lumina, and he's probably going to try and do the play that you were mentioning. Aqua returned the active whilst combining a Collapse Stadium to get rid of the other one, making it so that Tord will have a hard time taking a follow-up knockout here. Eyeing down the potential Radiant Charizard. Ooh, the Oranguru, very nice. As we saw, multiple bosses orders in the hand maybe could start to manipulate that and leave some of those cards back in the deck as you don't need two right now. Maybe you can find an additional resource here to, to help out. Lucas going for that fourth Aurora toward now with the knowledge that all four are available. Going for the power-up on the Luminion. And you have to wonder what Pokemon will Lucas promote as the sacrificial one after he uses Aqua Return. Yep, maybe enough energies are in play to where you can feel comfortable promoting uh, the Archeops. Uh, certainly, you can see that uh, you will have enough energies on that Evital to take some prize cards in the future, but it does leave uh, you leaving a, a little bit extra from your hand. You'll need to have energies, or at least the, uh, the double turbo in use to use a lot of your other attacks. One boss's orders does go down, however, with this research. One was protected thanks to Oranguru, but now the other one is in the discard pile, making it a little bit harder to cost up the right Pokemon, as Lucas will have one boss's orders and two Serenas, but of course Serena cannot bring up an Archeops or an Oranguru, or that very likely Radiant Charizard towards the end of the game. And there's the Collapse oh, oh. Stadium! Yes, that was absolutely crucial there. Uh, doing this in the perfect order, grabbing all of those energy cards out of the deck, and then, of course, saving that uh, boss's orders. The six remaining cards needed to find that Collapse Stadium and is going to uh, take all of these V Pokemon off of the board now, uh, almost solidifying at least one additional turn for Lucas to stay in this game with a, a plenty of Pokemon to close out. Now this is an interesting uh, hesitation by Lucas. He's definitely trying to figure out which Pokemon is the best to promote. By committing that Evil Doll here, it does stop Luminion from being able to get a KO. But now Archeops is the real threat here. Archeops could take down this Evil Doll, putting Tord Reckliff at one prize card remaining. And then it's going to be on Lucas to be able to close out this game. It will literally come down to can Tord or will Tord eventually miss an attack, or at the very least, a knockout. Yeah, that does also mean that we likely will see the Luminion stay on the board, uh, as it won't be using Aqua Return, and I think that is something that we definitely need to, to note here, as Lucas is looking at that as his prize map to victory, at least one additional prize uh, at some point on one of these single prize Pokemon, and then clearing off uh, the victory there with the, the, the Luminion. This is where we see the big advantage of going first. Tord has not exhausted those powerful energies just yet. He still has access to them. Thanks to not needing a bunch of them to knock out a Lugia V-Star, he only needed a few energies to knock out Lucas's starting Lugia V. So we are going to go ahead and see Tord utilize those powerful energies, make sure that he has the right amount in case he needs to attach a double turbo energy to counteract that powerful and I believe he has enough energies left in his deck so this promotion from Lucas needed to be perfect and um, he needs to find a way to prevent Tord from getting a knockout next turn. It seems difficult as Tord has done an excellent job preserving a plenty of resources here. You even see 
an energy like that Aurora energy coming down, which could be beneficial on a Pokemon like that Radiant Charizard. So uh, certainly you would expect to see the reach from Tord for that next turn with another Aurora energy, perhaps. I do see his last Aurora energy is left in his deck. So chooses not to bench that Radiant Charizard off of that capture and your Oh, maybe it was the second Archive's ability attaching it, sorry. Um, all right. So that Charizard still available as an option. Luminion also available in case Lucas goes for his own Charizard. There is exactly one Aurora Energy in Tord's hand. So if that gets Marnied away, he will have access to it with Arceops. And if it doesn't, then he can just attach it from hand to power up potentially Luminion or potentially Radiant Charizard. Also love to see that the Powerful Energy was kept in the deck in the additional uh, powerful energy was played on the benched Archeops. That means that it could potentially attack a Archeops for the victory on the next turn if this active were to fall. But we do see Tord Reckliff moving down to just one prize card remaining here against the three of Lucas with under 10 minutes to go here. And this is going to be quite the turn here for Lucas to try to figure out how to stay in this matchup. There's a capture energy which might prompt a Radiant Charizard, maybe even a Lugia if he has enough powerful energies left. The Lugia V could be seen as an attacking option. It does have the highest amount of HP, but if Lucas does not disrupt toward Reckliff's hand, I do believe he's already holding that Ultra Ball to search for the Radiant Charizard. Yeah, we see Lucas considering Radiant Charizard along with that Heat Energy, the, the Lugia V, and just getting four energies accelerated there. And it looks like the Archeops is going to start to help out this Lugia V in one final attack. There's the three powerful energies onto that Lugia, so definitely enough to be able to take a knockout right here. So then, can Lucas make sure that Tord is not able to find the Charizard? I think it was very smart for Tord not to bench that Charizard. It would potentially allow Lucas to take it down, but by leaving it in the deck, instead of in his hand does mean that if he does get Marnie, then he still has a chance to draw it off his deck. And there's the Marnie. Yeah, Tord keeping the hand down and just breathing, hoping to hold on to the resources that could potentially be the closeout here. And Lucas finding the Marnie to potentially stay in this game, keep this Lugia V around for an additional turn. And we will see the arrow dive here for the knockout on the Archeops removing uh, one decently sized threat. And we'll see if Tord can find the answer. Tord has a Quick Ball and an Ultra Ball in his hand, has a Charizard in the deck, and we did see that Aurora going back. So we're going to see the Quick Ball that he also did top deck. Lugia gets discarded. Charizard will get fully powered up here, and there's no way this Lugia can survive here. That and there's the game. That will be enough. Tord Reckliff coming out on top here in Latin America. He has done it. He has taken all four hemispheres of the globe, and you can see the look on him now, as this means so much to Tord as he has finally taken over the globe, and he is the Latin American International Champion. Even his tennis shoe is celebrating right there with him. What what an amazing win, what, what a game, and I don't think it's a coincidence that both players here, they end up winning their game that they started, right? Both players with hyper-consistent deck lists, both decks did what they needed to do every single turn, and Tord never missing a beat here to take his fourth international championship win. Yep, the only thing that could defeat Tord today was the stage, and that's definitely something that uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll think back to and, uh, and laugh later on, but what an amazing performance that he has had. Uh, absolutely incredible, as he has defeated Lucas Calza in an incredible mirror match here taking the final international championship that he needed to take over the world. What a run by both players. Of course, Lucas had that outstanding day one, outstanding day two, making it all the way to the finals as the first seed from day one. That doesn't happen too, too often, but here he is with the biggest match in his career and a fantastic result to add to his already growing list of accolades this season. Absolutely unbelievable. The Lugia mirror match is something that we have been seeing time and time again here on the feature stage, and I don't think we've seen it played any better than with these two players.
for Reclip. Four international wins, has won a tournament in every regional that allows him to play in. Will he be able to carry this on throughout the rest of the season? We're only, this is the first international championship this season. There's still three more to play for. That was unbelievable. What a way to start out the season here, of course, toward Reklev already with a regional win under his belt and then taking uh, this Latin American championship. I mean, uh, we, we talked about this before even round 15 started, and you said, what are the chances he takes over? I gave him 40%. Maybe I should have bumped that up a little higher. And then, of course, I wanted to drop that very low when I saw that Sander was his opponent in the top eight. And why do, why do we ever doubt this man? Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I was looking at that game against Sander, and I honestly had said, nope, there's no way he's pulling through. But here he is as the champion. And we were talking about that potential problem he will now have where his fourth trophy doesn't match the other three, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that will be devastating when he returns to Norway, but uh, absolutely incredible performance. And we have to give uh, some props here to Lucas as well. 9-0 in this tournament to start uh, day one. And of course, we're uh, very thankful that he was able to uh, pl play out the rest of this game. He's got to make a flight, and uh, that's understandable as well, but he's going to be leaving here with plenty of prize cards and uh, memories that will not be soon forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. Lucas also positioning himself very well going into the season. Probably at this point, a day two invite for him is a shoe in for Yugo Hama, so I'm sure we'll be hearing more about Lucas throughout the rest of the season. Eventually, when we get the EUIC tournament as well, with these players from Europe defending their home turf, I'm sure they're looking forward to that. It was uh, something that we will not soon forget. Both players really. Uh, giving us uh, an amazing performance. And when you think about the Lugia Mirror match, th this went 65 minutes. This was a, that was quite a game. But to see uh, both players really having to think about every single play and toward eyeing down the prize map, that's something that we, we talk about with these players so often. There is a huge threat in this amazing where you was all just staring you down. You have the answer there in your opposing you all, and you say, I don't care. I'm just going to start taking prize cards. I'll find a way to win. And sure enough, it was right there. Yeah, Tord completely ignoring that fully part of Evil Tall for a turn. That's certainly something that not always can be done when playing these matchups. But it was like he really mapped out his prizes perfectly and he found the resources he needed when he needed them. So it all comes down to that. And I think that speaks volumes once again of the consistency. Both players were basically able to get their Lugia set up. Tord did miss that second bench Lugia in that second game. But thankfully, he was able to take that game three. Well, we do have a champion and we are going to speak with them now. Let's go ahead and take this down to the stage to see Tord Reklev. Absolute pleasure and privilege to introduce not only the Latin American international champion, but now a four-time international champion, Tord Reklev. Tord, I've got to imagine it is an absolute whirlwind of emotions for you right now. And it is a bit, bit cliche to ask, but I've just got to know, and I'm sure that people want to know as well, what's going through your mind in this moment? I'm about to cry. I don't, I don't know. I'm speechless. An absolutely incredible game. Let's talk for a moment about this match. Your opponent, Lucas Calza from Italy, playing the same deck as you. And we've talked all weekend about how this Lugia Mirror has been such a massive part of this tournament. How did your previous matches through the event help you navigate what you needed to do here in this final match? Well, the Lugia Mirror can, be, can go one or two ways. You can either try to win on resources, try to force your opponent to spend a lot of energies to actually get through the game, or you can try to win on tempo. Winning on tempo costs a lot of resources because you have to attack with your single prices again. So that's kind of like a difficult balance. If you're in the early game, are forced to discard a couple energies, they can really come and bite you in the later stages of the game. Uh, game one, for example, I was, I was out of energies. Yes, and that's actually, you mentioned resources. I wanted to ask you about this. You had one energy remaining in the deck. Your Charizard was on the bench, the final powerful colorless energy in the prize cards. In that moment, were you worried that there was a chance Lucas could just pass and you wouldn't be able to do anything about it? Yes, of course. So we, we played a little bit of a mind game there. That was my only hope, and it, it somehow worked out. Yeah, Lucas ends up conceding, and you win that game one. 
Game two, on the other hand, things didn't quite go your way. We've obviously talked so much about how going first is a great advantage in the mirror. There are things you can do going second, but one of those pieces is getting down to Lugia V. You weren't able to do that, and Lucas was able to capitalize. Yes, if you go second and get down one Lugia, then uh, it snowballs drastically from there. And, uh, and Lucas had a really good start. Got the double Archeops with the boss. Uh, where the ghost effect on my on my Lugia. It was basically game over, but I decided to like continue playing because we have we had plenty of time, so there was no reason not to. It's the final, right? Might as well give it a shot. And I do want to speak one moment on the absolute consistency of your deck. A Rangaroo, a card that I know you are a big fan of. Many players coming into this weekend, I didn't feel like we're super hype on the card. Your opponent obviously had it in his deck as well. How important has that been for you, especially on these games going first? We saw you utilize that multiple times when you're going first, trying to prep a card on top, helping to be able to withstand a Marnie from your opponent on turn one. Or well, in like, absolute MVP. Marnie is a card in the format. Almost every deck plays it. And if you draw four bad, bad cards of the Marnie and your top deck, then you're kind of screwed, right? But with uh, the Oranguru, you can prepare yourself. The main thing about it is that with this deck, you you want all your energies to be in the deck, right? So you can randomly uh, struggle if you draw into a bunch of energies. Uh, if you don't have a guru, you have no real way to fix that apart from Marnie again. But as you can see, like these games are very aggressive. You can't always do that. Sometimes you can't afford to play Marnie. You need to like you need to play a boss or Serena to gust, right? Um, so instead, you can use Soren Guru to kind of fix the problem. It's not like foolproof. If you draw like five energies, it's still annoying, but it helps a lot. You can basically get rid of like two energies a turn, one from hand and one Oranguru, and that, that speeds up like those bad rolls quite a lot. So now, after that game three, you were able to keep up the tempo, keep up the aggression, and you were just able to come out on top, capitalizing on, of course, being able to go first in that mirror match. You now find yourself a four-time international champion, winning one of each of the four internationals. We are officially living in Towards World. Congratulations to you, my friend. I'm sure there's much more on the docket for you this season. Where can we expect to see you next? I'll be in Toronto Originals next week. <laughs> so we'll see you there. One week away, this man does not rest. Congratulations, my friend. Very, very excited for you. Let's hear it for our international champion one more time. And I'll throw it back over to the desk. Kyle and Pablo, take